Hello. Wow. All right. Um, my name is Pastor Rudy. I'm the pastor of this fine church. And I want to thank Earl for giving us an update on yesterday. It was a fine day uh, for a charge conference. A lot of business stuff, but um, I think you'll be happy to know that your church is in fine condition, fine shape. And so we're thankful for that. Thankful to God for that. Um, but one of the things that I want to just point out today for those that are viewing and uh, those that are here is that we only have one purpose here, and that is indeed to love God. But on top of that, we also love to love people. So here we are today to do exactly that. So if this is your first time, I just would love to meet you. And I think I've made my way through the congregation for those that have been visiting for the first time and say hello. And uh, at this time, I think it'll be appropriate for us to uh, have a word of prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and all wise God, we just love and adore you. And we give you praise and honor and glory just for this day. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to be in this edifice, God. But more importantly, we thank you for your son, Jesus, the Christ. We ask, oh God, that you bless all of those that are under the sound of my voice, oh God, and those that don't even have a mind to be here, but those that are sick, those that are shut in, God, we, we pray, Lord, that they will feel your presence today in a powerful way. So be with them, God, and uh, allow them to know you and the pardon of their sins as you are known to us in that way as well. And we know, oh God, that one day, one day we will be indeed joined with you. But until then, God, give us the strength, give us the grace, give us the power to enable us to serve you all the more. Bless this service, God, so that we indeed may be found pleasing in your sight. We thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this time, I will turn it over, turn their service over, and if you will, uh, join us this morning uh, to lead us in our service. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, good morning. My name is Milo Molina, and it is my joy to assist in the worship service this morning. At this time, we are, we are going to have our ministry moment, which is based on uh, United Methodist Student Day. We all know what it's like to dream, to want to contribute a verse, shape the future, or make the world a better place. But the dreams God plants in each of us don't just grow on their own. They need to be watered with love and support in order to thrive. For more than 80 years, the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry has empowered United Methodist partners just like you to nurture the dreams of tomorrow's leaders through United Methodist Student Day. Your support on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church means leaders of tomorrow receive critical financial aid that turns their dreams into reality. Thanks to your generosity, more than 2,300 scholarships are awarded each year, with 500 of those going to seminary students. In the last few years alone, more than $13 million has been awarded to students, with 60% of all aid going to female students. Your generous gift on United Methodist Student Day is specially designated to support this critical cause of awarding scholarships and financial aid to aspiring students, some of whom may be right in your own church or your own neighborhood. When you give generously on United Methodist Student Day, you qualify these young leaders to alleviate suffering both here and around the world. You embolden them to speak truth to power. You equip them to free the oppressed. You liberate them from crushing debt. Most important, you empower the dreams that will change the world through faithful service for Christ. Give generously to the United Methodist Student Day Offering. Support a dream for tomorrow and shape the future today. At this time, will everyone please join me in reciting the uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And will everyone please stand and join me to our call to worship, which is on the screens behind me. Not one stone will be left on stone. 
We worship our rock and our salvation. Beware that one leads you astray. We worship our source of wisdom and truth. When all seems lost, this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. We are here to worship the word that endures and the hope that is born among us. And at this time, we'll be having our opening hymn, which is 154. <laughs> to recite the Apostles' Creed, an affirmation of faith that is said by Christians and churches all around the world. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'll be having our children's message by uh, Tiffany. Hi, good morning, everyone. I think um, Ms. Carol was going to help bring the kids down to the front. It's hard for me to see when everyone's down there. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I think as we get started, um, Mr. McAvoy was going to help me run a short video for you guys this morning. And we will do a a Bible verse and a prayer and wrap things up. What a gorgeous day. These woods are so pretty. Hi, Mr. Trail Guide. You seem upset. What's up? It's terrible. Terrible. Ooh, I smell a story. What's the disaster? Flood, landslide, forest fire? Worse, there's a goober guide on the loose. Goober guide? What's that? 
Now and then, some know-nothing goober pretends to be a guide, and hikers make the mistake of following him. And a misguided guide can get hikers hurt. I call them goober guides. How can they get hikers hurt, Mr. Trail Guide? Well, they lead hikers off trail, or the guide pretends to know which plants are safe to eat. Last year, some goober served a poison ivy salad to hikers. Oh, it wasn't pretty. What else? Well, I'll show you. Take this sign. It wasn't pointing towards Peaceful Path. It was pointing hikers straight towards Calamity Cave. And that's a problem. I'll say it is. That's the deepest, darkest cave in the forest. This morning a lady fell in and she still hasn't hit bottom. That's awful. Yo, she'll be fine. We keep a trampoline down there so she'll bounce back up in an hour or two. So hikers should never follow a false guide. Never. Only trust guides who know the terrain and who are serious about caring for you. Never trust a fake guide. But how can we tell the difference between goober guides and the real deal? We real guides have these cool uniforms, and we all know the official trail guide song. Which goes, how? <clears throat> Don't do something silly out there, or you'll get eaten by a grizzly bear. The bear will thank you for his snack, but all that's left of you will be your pack. Nice! And there you have it, listeners. Always follow the right guide. And the right guide is never a goober. <laughs> so that's kind of funny, but also kind of true, right? Although the Bible doesn't call them goobers, the Bible calls them false guides that will try to deceive us. So I'm going to read you a Bible verse, um, Mark 13, actually verses 1 through 8. Jesus is talking to his disciples, but specifically in verse 5 and 6, Jesus said unto them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. But you know what, great kids, is that even if you're not sure, if, you're, if you've got a goober in your life, or maybe you you think there's a goober in your life, you have trusted adults um, surrounding you that are always here to pray for you and to help you um, so that you don't get led into those dark caves that the video talks about that cause hurt and pain in, in life. So let's pray together um, if, we, if we could. Dear Jesus, help us read our Bibles every day and follow Jesus' teachings. Guide us from those that would deceive us and cause hurt and pain in our life. Amen. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll be having our scripture reading, which comes from Hebrews chapter 11, 1 through 3. Yeah, verse 1 through 3. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now on to verses 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were um, heirs with him of those same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, wasn't able to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one, from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as, a, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. 
All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things, pro things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been talking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were long, longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, we'll be having our hymn of preparation, number 467. trusting I'm trusting in the Lord I'm obeying in the Lord so we know all things are going to work together for the good and I think uh, this is an amazing message here today not because I'm delivering it but because it's it's based on God's word and God's word is here to encourage us and sometimes even to chastise us to get us into the right place with God and the right relationship with God so the guy can do a work, the work that he has designed for our lives uh, while, we, while we're in this foreign land. How many people here know that this is not your home? I know we can get comfortable here, but just as soon as we get comfortable, guess what? Yeah, things change. So we're always reminded that we're not here, but just for a little while. The Bible says we're like a vapor. And we're only here for a little while. So while we're here, we're going to need some encouragement because things don't always work out way we hope things don't always work out the way they seem but if we trust god things going to work out for the good and we have to always remind ourselves of that uh from time to time uh this is no different from what was going on during the time that this scripture from hebrews was written the, the, the big faith chapter the uh the newly converts uh, the new converts were going through some real tough times 
uh, you know, is, is really interesting. Even when people come to join the church or they give their lives to Jesus, you know, uh, what we say, we hope for the best, but expect the worst, <laughs> because that's when the enemy really gets at work. And that's what was happening for these new converts. They were going through a real tough time following, being, following the way, if you will, before they got to be known Christians. Their families uh, were disowning them. They weren't following tradition. Um, they were being exploited, taken to court. They were being cheated out of their money. They were having a real tough time. And so uh, the writer, the author of this uh, Hebrews, um, well, wanted to tell them to hold on to the faith. No matter what, hold on. And I think that message still rings true today that I don't know each and every one of your stories. I know a lot of your stories, but I do know this, that life is challenging and that each and every one of us in this journey called life will be challenged somehow, some way to leave the faith. But as the author of Hebrew tells us, I am saying to you today, hold on, hold on to your faith. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy, Jesus, than to trust and obey. Let us pray. Most gracious and all wise God, I thank you again for allowing me, your humble servant, to stand at this sacred desk. For Lord, I don't take it lightly, but you know I have indeed studied. I've studied this word, but I still need your strength. I have prepared, but I still need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. So silently now, oh God, I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see. Open mine eyes, O God, and illumine me. Sweet spirit divine. Amen. Oh, and before we go any further, I just want to thank Tiffany. Let us give God praise for Tiffany. This technology is amazing. And I just uh, thank all of those that take time out to make it happen. Uh, who would have thought, right? Who would have thought that we would have had uh, Tiffany from Texas uh, delivering the children's uh, sermon, what, no more than a year or so ago. But it's happened, and by the grace of God, it is uh, true. Um, let's get right into it. Um, th this this Hebrew uh, chapter is, is, of course, I've already said, the great faith chapter of the entire Bible. If you want to check out what faith is really about, look at Hebrews 11. That's your go-to. And first and foremost, what we're going to learn here very quickly in this uh, chapter. Matter of fact, in the first verse, we're going to actually learn what faith is. We're going to learn what the Bible says about faith. And that's where I always want to refer back is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible have to say about that? And the Bible will, in fact, tell us what faith is, and we'll find it here. And then the other thing is that uh, this, this uh, chapter will sh not only uh, define faith for us, but it will also show us through examples of patriarchs, matriarchs, and the Bible, folks that you've heard about and how their walk with God was counted as faith. So faith in action. You know, faith is an action word. It's a verb, right? It's not something that, I mean, in order to have faith, you have to do something. It's evidence of who we believe in is through our actions. So faith is an action word. So uh, we're going to not only define faith here, but we're also going to look at the Bible to see the examples of those persons who uh, were the matriarchs and patriarchs of faith that uh, were looked upon as examples. Um, these people is really interesting because I'm a person who believes in um, generational prayer. What, what I, I think I've said that before here, I'm not so sure, but um, your prayer may not be answered in your generation, but it doesn't mean that it will not be. These patriarchs and matriarchs of the Bible, part of what makes them so unique is the fact that the things that they prayed about, things that they believed in, things that God promised didn't necessarily come to pass in their lifetime, but yet they stood believing. So that was counted as righteousness to God. And so this is an important thing that no matter what you may be believing, you may be praying for your grandchild. You may be praying for your children. You may be praying for a lot of different things that are important and dear to you. And guess what? We may not see it come in our lifetime. Not here. But I do believe there's a cloud of witnesses that are looking down. We were talking about TC this morning. So, I mean, I know that there are things that he prayed about that he may not have been here to see come to pass. But guess what? He will see it. 
he will see it from where God's vantage point will allow him to see it. Things about this church, things with his family, things about his spouse and friends. And so um, just know that continue to pray. Don't give up. Continue to hold on uh, to your faith. For example, Abraham, who didn't uh, live long enough to see the promise of a nation of Israel come to pass that was supposed to come from his seed. But it did. You understand what I'm talking about? So he continued to become, he still stayed faithful throughout his lifetime. And um, what I want you to also understand is that the Bible, this particular chapter was, 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 was introduced in chapter 10. And in chapter 10, there were two particular verses I want you to pay attention to. And you don't have to do it here. But when you get a chance to look at your Bible, the last two verses in chapter 10 kind of introduce what's coming. And in those two verses is that, we're, first of all, the righteous live by faith. So no matter what is going on in your life, make sure you hold on to your faith. It will be counted as righteousness. And number two is that faith is directly, not indirectly, directly linked to salvation. Your salvation of your soul is directly linked to your faith. Let's look at verse one. Let's take a peek. It says, now faith is confidence and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. You see, in this particular verse here, the appropriate word or the Greek word that I would prefer to see here for assurance is not necessarily assurance, but reality. When you go from assurance to the reality, it's almost as if it's tangible, almost as if you could touch it, almost as if you can attain it, even though it has not manifested in the natural. That is what faith is all about, okay? And so for true believers, faith is just knowing the reality of things, which can only come through hoping, hoping. Hope is the beginning of our faith. So as believers, the reality is that it becomes so real that what it is that we're hoping for just seems like it's already come to pass. Now in verse two, we see it's right here in front of us. In this particular verse, the offer is referring to ancient people. We talked about that, the patriarchs, the matriarchs, those people that these Jewish people who are now new converts, they knew from their history. They knew from the storytelling. I don't know about you, but I've had stories told to me about my grandmother. I have, I've had stories told to me about my aunts and my uncles and how they stood on faith in, in, in spite of what odds they have faced, they have had to face. They stood on the word of God. That was faith stories. That faith story helped me and my faith. So don't shrink back. When it's time for you to share and to witness with your children and your grandchildren about your faith, how you were able to make it through during difficult times, how you prayed to the Lord in difficult times, and God carried you through. Let us look at verse 3. The author goes on to say here in verse 3, by faith. Now, we're going to hear a lot about that, right? We understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I, I know there's been a lot of concern about what our ch children are being taught in schools, right? <laughs> so, so this is one of those things, right? Where people have been dating for a long, I mean, debating for a long time. You know, people have this different theories on how the world came into existence and so forth. But here, according to the Bible, right? This particular author goes back to the creation story where Adam and Eve and the universe was created out of simply nothing. Now, church family, the teachings of science, please get, hear me right here, that I believe that science is very important in our lives, um, and, but, uh, but um, like everything else, that, uh, it, it's limited, right? It's very limited. Science may have an idea of what happened back then, but science surely cannot answer why. The why question. <laughs> that lays with God. Also in our own lives, the why question, why, 
Is this happening to me? Why is this going on in our lives? I don't deserve this or, you know, the whys that come up for us. Why? That's a God thing. Uh, how do I often say? That's above my pay grade. I can't answer the why, but God can. The why can only be explained through faith. We have to trust that God has a purpose and a plan for everything under the sun. That God is sovereign. That if God's signature is not on the check, it will not cash. Right? Kim, if you don't sign my check, it will not cash. <laughs> Please sign. But anyway, I'm going on vacation. Come on, give me a break. But anyway, for it is by faith that we believe, right? In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. That's the why for us. That settles it. If God said it, he meant it. That settles it in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. That's, that's good enough for me. God took the initiative. He took the initiative to create. He's a creative God. Then in verse 8, we learn by faith. Here we go again with this faith thing. And we go back to Abraham because Abraham is someone that they held in high esteem. Abraham was a household name in the Jewish family. So even though they're converts, they still rely upon the ancients. Abraham, to go to the place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I don't know if you know this or not. That guy. This guy here is what is called an African impala. Um, uh, this animal here, it is amazing. It could actually jump to heights of over 10 feet, and it can cover distances of 30 feet with one single leap. That's pretty amazing to me, right? However, this magnificent creature... Uh, can be kept in any zoo with simply a three-foot wall. Why? Because he will not jump if he does not know where his feet are landing. That's the way we are. But that's not how Abraham was. Abraham, on the other hand, was not like this African impala. God commanded Abraham to leave his country, to leave his father's house, to leave those things that were familiar to him, to go to a place that he did not know. That's faith. Yet God didn't give Abraham even a roadmap on how to get there. He didn't even know the destination. Yet he went. He, God simply said it. God, did, Abraham did it. And he went. So we can easily see Abraham's first act here of obedience was to simply take a leap of faith without knowing where his feet would even land. And that's why we truly have to say that faith is action. He couldn't have stayed back at home and said, I'm a person of faith. No. Faith requires us to act, to leave, in many cases, our comfort zones and, and many times our security of home. But without reservation, Abraham left. He didn't hesitate. He took that leap of faith, an act that demonstrated trust and obedience to God's word. That's what God's looking from us. Don't hesitate. Obey. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Trust in God's word. Never fail you. Never fail you. So that, I think, is uh, a point worth putting up on the board. And that is trust and obey God's word. Verse 9 tells us that by faith, uh, he, meaning Abraham, made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger. I love this part. I love this part. In the foreign country, he lived in tents. And he did, and as Isaac did, 
and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. Why is this important here? The land where Abraham eventually landed was a place called Canaan, later to be known as the promised land. But the Bible says that Abraham experienced the promised land like a stranger, like a stranger in a foreign country. Uh, and, and he went as far as he just continued to live in tents. Why did he do this? Well, church family tents, uh, back in those days, they served as a temporary shelter. They still do, I believe. The Boy Scouts go out tents, right? Am I right? But, but they're not going to stay here for long. Are, are, are you seeing where I'm going with this? Abraham didn't want to really make this his home. He didn't really want to make this a, a place or a place, a dwelling place for eternity. See, God has greater things in store for us. And we're here just for a little while to do it, his bidding and his will and to raise our families so that they may be the next generation to carry on the faith. And when that time has come, I remember my father, and I've told you this before, when, 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 when he laid and took his last breath, he said to me, he says, I wish I could have left you more. Ah, he left me with faith. That is what sustains me. Not a bank account, not property, not land, but my faith. And the same faith that Abraham has is the same faith we can have. That we have to just say for ourselves, look here. And I know I've heard Steve. Is Steve with us? He said that himself as he went into the hospital. He said, guess what? I'm prepared. I'm prepared to meet Jesus. If he chooses for me to stay, so be it. Am I right, Steve? You're on me. It's okay. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> just nod up and down. Just agree with me. <laughs> but this is a conversation we've had. And I hope that you'll have the same conversation. Because some have you ever seen people fight to the bitter end? Just relax. It's going to be okay. It'll be okay. Just trust in the Lord. Trust and obey. Okay, so let's move on here. And... Um, then let's move on to uh, here. It says, then in verse 10, the Bible further explains, for Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is who? Is God. I don't know about you. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not in a hurry, right? But I do have a lot to look forward to. I have a lot to look forward to in the here and, and after that God has made and prepared a place for me. That's why I'm going to be honest, even with my parents gone, and I love them. I, oh, I think, and I thank God for them every day. I just thank them, but I know they're okay. And when people say, oh, they're in a better place, I go like, I know that sounds like a cliche, right? And it is, but it's true. I know that my parents are in heaven. They're with God, with a, in a place that's not made with hands and mortar, a place that's eternally made for them. You see, church family, the author of Hebrews tells us that by faith, Abraham actually looked to another kind of city, a truly spiritual city, a city destined and, and designed and established by the creator. Because in the beginning, God made what? And... Right? It only stands the reason. You don't, how, did I say this last week? You can't make this stuff up. Right? But, 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 but that's why people are walking around without much hope because they don't take time to learn the word. I get excited over this stuff. Can you tell? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. All right. And if we look at the book of Revelation, it, it, it fleshes this kind of stuff out. It talks about a new Jerusalem. And I love that because the old Jerusalem or, 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 or the Jerusalem that we know as being in the uh, holy land, that's made by this. But there's a new Jerusalem. And that was supposed to be the place where the presence of God was, right? But this new Jerusalem we know is, is, is where God is. This is where God rests, rules, and abides. And one day, one day, that new Jerusalem is going to come down. That's what it says. It's going to come down upon the earth. And I want to be ready for when that new heavenly city comes and makes itself known. And it is that time that God will wipe away 
every tear and every heartache and every brokenness. There'll, there'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more weeping. There'll be no more wailing. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more poverty. Everything we made new. Isn't that something to look forward to? The former things, the Bible says, will all pass away. It'll all be made new. All be made new. And then in verse 11, we learn this. And by faith, even Sarah, his wife, we're talking about Abraham's wife, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him, meaning God, faithful, who had made a promise. I love this part. I guess I love all parts, right? I said that back then. But anyway, the reason I love this is because it's interesting how this particular verse says that, um, that, that Sarah considered God faithful. Well, if you have read your Bibles, when, when it was announced by, I think it was three travelers that came. They were angels. And they came to announce that, that she would have this child, right? What did Sarah do? She laughed. In fact, that is Isaac's name is laughter. She laughed. And so it's interesting here that even in the midst of her doubt, we can't, we can't, we can't just sweep that under the rug. In the midst of her doubt, in the midst of our doubt, somehow, some way, God will prove his faithfulness. And didn't he do it? He did by giving them a child, even though she laughed, even though she doubted, even though she didn't have the faith at that time, God still saw fit that he would fulfill a promise that he had already made. I love that part about God. God has promised us, church family. And even when we have, listen to this, those moments of doubt. God still comes through. So here we see that even Sarah realized this. And even as a matriarch of the faith, she's been able to pass that on to us. That even if you have a moment of doubt, church family, please know that God is faithful. Please, whatever you know, God is faithful. Point number two. What do you say? Huh? God is faithful. God is faithful. Verse 12 states this. And so from this one man, meaning Abraham, and he has good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. You see, church family, um, I, I, I want to say here, the point of this particular verse is not the countlessness of God's blessings. The, the, the point here that the Lord revealed to me is that even though he was good as dead because of his age, nothing's too hard for our God. Even though things may seem as though they have passed the possibilities of taking place, hold on to God's word. Hold on, because if God promised it, he meant it. And guess what? That settles it. So even here, even though uh, Abraham was past what they would call, and, and Sarah, childbearing age, God did it anyway. And that proves his power. Now, if they had done it in their 20s, it, and nobody would have thought that was a big deal. Am I right? 30s, right? Okay. 40s. Mm, 50s. Mm, 60s. Mm. 80s? <laughs> That's God. <laughs> okay. And so God wants to get the glory. And in this, he certainly did get the glory. And so nothing is too hard for God. Nothing at all. And just think about it. With Jesus being our internal priest, now we have direct access to that kind of God. That kind of power. That kind of God. Verse 13. Almost there. Hold in there with me. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised in this lifetime, right? Here's the Bible tells it right here. Here's my forward thinking, my forward prayer, my, 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 uh, my uh, uh, ancestry prayer thing. This, this, you know, descendants, pray for your descendants. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers 
on earth. It's written in the text, Abraham died, obviously, without receiving the things promised, and his descendants wouldn't either. We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Until many years later, nevertheless, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob embraced God's promises from afar. They're in heaven, and they're still knowing that God is faithful. So while here, they lived as foreigners and strangers. Verse 14, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Notwithstanding Abraham's visit for vision for his descendants, finally came true only after being in Egypt. 400 years. That's a long time. And on top of that, they had to spend 40 more years wandering around in the wilderness. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, longing for home, longing for here, they would have had opportunity to return, but they didn't think that way. Neither should we. Church family, if Abraham and Sarah had decided to go back home, to go back to Haram, they would have been welcomed, they would have been embraced, but they never would have fulfilled the promises of God. Yet they chose, and it's our choice too. They chose to remain faithful. Verse 16, instead, they, meaning Abraham and Sarah, were longing for a better country. They didn't keep their eyes here on this, but their eyes on the prize, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city, a city for them. Whether we realize it or not, church family, this world is, again, is not our home. We're, we're just foreigners. We're just passing through, only here for a little while. So like Abraham and Sarah, we too are longing for our heavenly home. Point number three and final verse for final point for the day is what? Heaven is our home. Meanwhile, what do we do? Until we reach our destination, a place we've never seen, but we trust that is there by faith, just like Abraham, right? What do we do? Well, we trust and obey. We trust and obey the promises of God as we live as pilgrims in this very, very weary, weary land. And like Abraham and Sarah, God will be pleased with not only them, but also with us. And he will not, isn't this beautiful? He will not be ashamed to call us his children and for us to call him our God. So be it. Amen. At this time, we'll be having our tithes and offerings. Let us give as God has so abundantly given to us. There are envelopes in the pews that allow you to give through a variety of options. Also, there is a space for any prayer request that request that you have that you may have for the church. With grateful hearts, let us bring our tithes and offerings to to the God whom they came.
At this time, we'll be uh, praying with the prayer of, de of dedication. Most gracious and all wise God, we thank you for this opportunity to give back a portion of that you have which you allow us as present offerings to be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as we have um, our closing, uh, we will indeed uh, anoint. We know that uh, based upon the word of God, we're just here passing through. But while we're here, um, we need to be about being faithful, faithful to God. That's a large task. That's a huge task. But we can do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray that we may be faithful to God and one another. So as we close out, let us all come, uh, those that choose to be anointed. Let's also keep in mind uh, those that be traveling. I'm going to be traveling. I think Birches, you might be traveling. I don't know. I think that we have quite a few that are online that are traveling. I see Anita. Yeah. With, somebody said with palm trees. Like, you know. Yeah, nice deal. I love that palm tree deal. Okay, with that being said, let's stay focused. But there will be, <laughs> let me stay focused. <laughs> But certainly I know this is a time where we come to the Lord and we ask God's power, his anointing, his grace to be imparted upon us. Uh, won't you come? Absolutely. You guys have to always remind me to, to, to pray over the pizza and stuff like that and the ice cream cones. <laughs> hey, it's by God's grace, right? Uh, first of all, let's just give God praise. Lord, we just thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for the food. We thank you for the ice cream cones, all those wonderful things, Lord, that you have prepared for your people. And Lord, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we ask now, oh God, that you watch over each and every one of us. Lord, it's in your holy name we do pray. Amen. Go in peace and may the peace of the Lord go with you. Amen. And don't forget to see uh, Sue. Oh, Aiden, you.